Hi, my name is Kofi Boone. I'm here to talk about wicked problems from the perspective of landscape architecture. I teach landscape architecture at NC State and have learned through my practice and teaching that in fact, uh, landscape problems, environmental problems also include human beings. We don't often think about human beings as a part of the environment, but they are, we are, and how we take care of our human environments and one another is important to our natural environment. If you're anything like me, when I was your age, I'd never heard of landscape architecture. Uh, and just for everyone's benefit, landscape architecture is the analysis, design, planning, management, and stewardship of the built and natural environments. It's an actual profession. And so uh, when I grew up in Detroit, Michigan with my family, although I experienced the landscape, I had no idea that there were things you could do that can intentionally make it better or make it worse for environments and for people. We used to love playing in the river, uh, and that was really direct contact with the environment around us. And although there are a lot of stories about Detroit, uh, some of them valid, some of them not, I have very fond memories of growing up at home and really enjoying the environment as a part of my day-to-day -day life. And learned later that the place where you just saw those kids playing, Bell Isle Park, in part designed by one of the great landscape architects, Frederick Law Olmsted, was intentionally done. There was intention and thought given to the places where people occupy, places that are safe for our non-human friends, birds, fish, other forms of life, and in balance with the life of the city. But I also learned that design and planning could do great harm. And of course, Detroit, majority black city for a long period of time, uh, and dealing with the issues of politics and race and economics and culture and history, there were often conflicts between the places where everybody grew and developed their lives and their cultural histories and the needs of broader places. The image that you're seeing right now is of Black Bottom, named after the soil, not the color of the skin of the people in the community, but was a vibrant, thriving African-American community in Detroit in the early 20th century that was intentionally destroyed through freeway construction, urban renewal, removal of homes for new development. And so in the interest of growing our economy and growing our place, certain communities were sacrificed and designers and planners contributed to that harm. But what I'm excited about in terms of landscape architecture is the potential to heal those wounds. And so these are images from some of our students here at NC State rethinking the impacts of the Durham Freeway on Durham, North Carolina. On the left is a familiar image that shows the Bulls Stadium and American Tobacco Campus. You can see the freeway in the foreground, but we have the capacity and the potential now to envision and rethink the way that we structure our urban environments that are great for nature, great for people, great for climate, great for justice, but also uh, heal the damage done through design. I got an introduction to some of this thinking because I co-directed our Ghana Study Abroad program for many years. Uh, Ghana is in West Africa. The image that you see is of the Ashanti people. Uh, many of their contributions are mainstream in the West. Even if you saw the movie Black Panther, you saw images that came from Ghana and West Africa and the Ashanti people from uh, Dinkra cloth to Kente cloth to gold to many different things. Ghana is unique because in addition to the traditional values and the traditional ways of working, it's one of the fastest urbanizing and growing countries on Africa and in the world. And so you see in this image of Accra, all of the challenges in our built environment from growing populations to urban heat island, the fact that you don't see much shade in this particular picture, even though it's in the tropics. Dependency on fossil fuels and transportation, uh, access to food, uh, access to the basic needs of life are also present in this fast growing country. Uh, when we took students to Ghana to experience that, we learned that working collaboratively with communities was the best way to build trust, to build understanding, uh, to recognize that community people are experts in their own situations. We provide technical expertise, but they're experts on their lived experiences. And through that collaboration and that combination, we were able to honor those traditional beliefs, but also apply those traditional values and attitudes to new solutions that were authentic, that promoted justice and equity, and adapted to some of the climate issues that were there. And this image represents some of the student work uh, thinking through scaling up 
a small scale textile industry that also honored traditional values in Ghana. So everything from shade structures to using trees, to using the ground to lay out and, and dry cloth, uh, really including people in these images that live in those places. Those are all things that we try to teach and push forward as ways of dealing with these wicked problems of the environment and their relationship to people and humans and growth. Currently, we're looking at these issues in our own backyard. A lot of these uh, situations that we faced abroad are also true in our own backyard. Our most recent student work has really been focused on Charlotte as a part of the Green New Deal Super Studio. Really looking at how design and planning in the environment can advance issues of green jobs, can promote environmental justice, uh, and can also promote decarbonization. We know that by 2040, that's our date, right? Where we have to figure out how to reduce carbon, reduce methane, reduce other emissions that really contribute to the warming up of the planet and promote all of these uh, challenges that we're faced with. So in this image, you see students starting to show ideas of how uh, increasing density, allowing people to live uh, more compactly and more efficiently on the land, producing food, in this case on the rooftops of buildings, uh, having those become greenhouses, alternatives to driving and, and fossil fuel emitting vehicles. So using bikes, making things walkable and having access to light rail and different modes of transportation. Mixed use, so in your own backyard and a walking distance, having access to all your daily needs from shopping to eating to worship to work to education, really rethinking how we structure and organize our communities uh, to move forward in a just manner and an equitable manner and in a way that is responsible to the climate challenge that we all face.